Well, welcome to uh, Extreme Science, not here, the, the U.S. Antarctic Program. I am John Anderson, board chair of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, or C2ST, as we call it. I'm also professor of chemical engineering at Illinois Institute of Technology. C2ST, the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, is pleased to uh, partner with IIT's College of Science tonight to bring you Dr. Kelly Faulkner. C2ST is a not-for-profit organization that brings scientists and engineers in front of the public to discuss technical issues relevant to society. C2ST works with national laboratories, academic institutions, and museums to advance the public's awareness and appreciation of science. Our goal is to create an excitement about science, engineering, and technology, and remind the public of the importance of technology in our everyday life. If you like what you hear this evening, please consider supporting C2ST. By support, I mean please consider giving money. Okay, this is a philanth all the revenues come from philanthropic contributions. We have no source of revenue other than that, so please, uh, if you like what you see, considered being a donor to C2ST. We are pleased to be at Illinois Tech for this evening's program, and we thank Illinois Tech for its support of this program and its support of C2ST throughout the year. I would also like to thank Alan Shresheim and Phil Dowd for helping us bring Dr. Faulkner here today. I'm now pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Kelly Faulkner. Shown in this slide is the extreme environment of Antarctica. By the way, I think it's during the summer there, it's the warmer part of the season, uh, when the sun never sets. Dr. Faulkner recently had a chance to rub elbows with Secretary of State John Kerry when she hosted his visit to McMurdo Station to observe the NSF base for scientific research in Antarctica. Dr. Faulkner is the director of the Office of Polar Programs at the National Science Foundation. She also serves as the director of the U.S. Antarctic Program, which NSF manages on behalf of the U.S. government in accordance with Presidential Memorandum 6626. Four six? Oh, gee, I'm sorry. Correct that on the record. 6646, whatever that is, right? <laughs> and the terms of the Antarctic International Treaty. A member of the Senior Executive Service, Dr. Faulkner oversees an annual budget of $450 million for research and logistical support in both the Arctic and Antarctic. Dr. Faulkner joined, the, joined NSF in 2010 as Deputy Director of the Office of Polar Programs and transitioned to Director in 2012. During the International Polar Year, 2007-2008, she undertook a two-year assignment at NSF as the founding director for the Antarctic Integrated System Science Program, for which she was recognized in 2009 by the naming of Faulkner Glacier, located in the Mountaineer Range, Victoria Land, Antarctica. So her glacier is that little red dot, okay? That's Antarctica. Okay, now the confusing thing about Antarctica is you're in circular coordinates around there. You never know where east or west is or anything like that. All you know is north and south, okay. And uh, the glaciers on the right. Actually, uh, Dr. Faulkner is uh, shown in her business casual dress for, Antar for the South Pole. Uh, and the, the clothing weighs about 20, 25 pounds, I think, total when you put the bunny boots on, the coat and everything like that. A little more than that, because uh, she escorted me and some others to the South Pole, and it's tough going, and she'll tell you why uh, in, a, in a few minutes. She, she certainly serves, currently serves as the head of the U.S. delegation to the Arctic Council Ad Hoc Task Force for Enhancing Scientific Cooperation, and she is a member of the U.S. delegation to the annual Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting. Prior to federal service, Dr. Faulkner was professor in the College of Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. She and her students performed state-of-the-art chemical measurements to investigate a wide array of environmental topics, the results of which are presented in more than 60 peer-reviewed journal 
papers and book chapters. Dr. Faulkner earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Reed College in Oregon and a PhD in chemical oceanography from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution MIT joint program in oceanography in 1989. She conducted postdoctoral studies at MIT under the an NSF initiation award and uh, in Toulouse, France under a NATO postdoctoral fellowship and CNRS Post Rouge Award. It is my great pleasure to invite, to invite Kelly Faulkner to the podium. Kelly? Well, good evening. Thank you, John, for that kind introduction. And thank all of you for coming out on a weeknight. I know that's not so easy. <laughs> Um, so let me have a show of hands to, as a start. How many of you know that the U.S. Antarctic program is the world leading Antarctic research program? Ah, <laughs> well, I see some do. Um, but I'm here tonight to share with you reasons why the U.S. Antarctic program rightfully deserves to be a point of pride for all Americans. And so while it's true that Antarctica is an extraordinary place, I'm particularly proud of the extraordinary people from all walks of life who team together in Antarctica to accomplish really amazing scientific discoveries, despite all the challenges the environment throws at them. So I'm going to start my slides up here. Whoops, start at the beginning. All right. Yeah, that's way bigger than life, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but what I want to say is, is don't really look at her. The people that I just mentioned that do the hard work in Antarctica are truly the heroes of extreme science. And a lot of these dedicated people call Chicago home, as you'll learn about shortly. All right, so here's a brief outline of what I'd like to cover tonight. I'll start off with some background that answers questions like the following. What makes Antarctica such an extreme place? Why do people go there in the first place? And why do they go there now? What is the Antarctic Treaty and why is it so unique? How did the Antarctic program get started? So with that as background, I'll then share with you how we support scientific research today in one of the harshest environments on our planet. The U.S. Antarctic Research Program entails a wide array of science, everything from uh, microbiology to astrophysics and everything in between. So I'm not going to be able to cover it all tonight, but I'll share with you a, a number of highlights. So let's get started by heading as far south as you can go on our planet. To give you a sense of scale, we've superimpose the U.S. Uh, on this map. It's a vast continent, Antarctica. It's one and a half times the size of the continental U.S. And to help you get oriented, I'm going to review right now some of the main geographic place names. Pointing up towards South America is what we call the Antarctic Peninsula. Immediately to the right or east of that is the Weddell Sea. Down on this side of the continent is the Ross Sea, where NSF's McMurdo Station is located on Ross Island. And this arrow is, is pointing, it's a little hard to see with the US map in the way, but there's a, a mountain range there called the Transantarctic Mountains that separate the smaller west from larger East Antarctica. I have a few more maps where that'll become more apparent in a moment. And the geographic South Pole is indicated where that red dot is, uh, just under the southeast corner of Nebraska. All right, this is not Antarctica. Why am I showing you a picture of a desert? Well, Antarctica is also technically a desert uh, with a continent-wide average of precipitation of less than six inches per year. At the South Pole, over the polar ice cap, it's actually under two inches per year. And that can seem counterintuitive 
because if you set something on the surface on the polar plateau, including at the South Pole, things are quickly covered with snow. That snow is largely windblown, uh, not directly precipitated. The very dry atmosphere that is over the pole provides advantages uh, for science that I'll touch on in a moment. So Antarctica is the highest continent, due largely to its thick ice cover, as shown in this cross-section. In fact, Antarctica holds about 90% of the Earth's ice. That ice forms when snow accumulates and is compressed under its own weight. The massive ice sheet, with an average thickness of about one and a half miles, covers 98% of Antarctica. South Pole is sitting over ice nearly two miles thick. And Antarctica holds about 70% of the world's surface freshwater in the form of ice. Now, wait a minute. How can that be when I just told you that Antarctica is like a desert? Well, it doesn't snow a lot, but the snow has had a very a long time to accumulate there. We believe that the ice cap took hold in Antarctica about 32 million years ago. So if snow simply accumulated, over such a long time, we would in fact expect a lot thicker ice. However, over longer time frames, the ice behaves like a fluid. It, while it accumulates, it also flows. So one way of visualizing this is to think of the ice sheet like very thick pancake batter. So if you had a plate and you were to pour that pancake batter over the middle of it, and let's say there are bumps all over it, it would initially pile up in the middle, but then it would spread out around and over the bumps until it reaches the edge. So for Antarctica, the edges of the plate are the ocean. And when the flowing ice reaches the ocean, it either calves and breaks off in pieces called icebergs, or it forms floating tongues that can also calf or melt. And the thickness of the ice is a balance between the net snow uh, fall onto it and the losses from the calving and the melting and the sublimation. Antarctica boasts the coldest natural temperatures uh, recorded on Earth. The coldest temperature officially recorded was minus 128 degrees Fahrenheit, which is minus 92 centigrade, at Russia's Vostok Station in 1983. At South Pole Station, Winter temperatures average around minus 75 Fahrenheit. That's about minus 60 C. Um, but they can get as low as minus 100 Fahrenheit or minus 75 C. Summer temperatures at pole are around zero Fahrenheit or minus 20 C or so. Temperatures tend to be higher around the Antarctic perimeter. So for example, temperatures typically hover around freezing at McMurdo Station in the Austral summer but they can actually go above freezing, periodically gotten up to as much as uh, 50 Fahrenheit or about eight degrees C. As you can imagine, low temperatures spell serious challenges uh, for people and equipment in Antarctica. So the low temperatures are compounded by the wind. Antarctica can be extremely windy and the most extreme winds tend to be associated with gravity driven flow, which we call catabatic winds. These tend to pick up speed as they descend from the higher polar plateau out down to the coasts. And they can gust up to more than 200 miles an hour as they reach the edges of the continent. Uh, so in the photo, you're looking at a storm that was classified as um, condition two out of a scale of three that we use uh, for safety purposes there. And in this particular storm, the winds were about 60 miles an hour at McMurdo Station. So another prominent feature of Antarctica is her seasonal ice skirt. Sea ice forms when it gets cold enough for the surrounding surface ocean to freeze. Those cold catabatic winds can certainly promote sea ice formation. So Antarctic sea ice sets up annually in austral winter, and it typically is anywhere from three to nine feet thick and covered by snow. At its peak area in September, the area is about equal to that of the continent. And nearly all of that is melted away by the end of the austral summer in March. The annual sea ice cycle is truly one of the more spectacular phenomena on our planet. Now sea ice is really important for modulating the weather and the climate, as well as for the ice adapted ecosystems. With due caution, it can be a very useful platform for science, but it can also be a serious impediment to science and operations. 
Antarctica has no native peoples, and given how big it is, relatively few visitors. So today, the peak population occurs in austral summer, when about 4,000 people from the international research community and about 30,000 or more tourists visit. The tourists are transported largely but not exclusively by ships, as you see here. And tourism typically takes place in the austral summer when daylight extends around the clock, as John mentioned earlier, as opposed to the dark period of austral winter. Now, it really wasn't that long ago that there were no people in Antarctica. Recorded human history there dates back only a few hundred years. So, so for me to understand things, I always need to, to um, be grounded in the history of a place. So if you'll indulge me a few minutes, I'm going to share with you a brief history of Antarctica. So imaginative map makers in the Middle Ages postulated a mythical continent they named Terra Australis Incognita, which they asserted contained riches exceeding those yet known to man. So either a lucky guess or possibly the fake news of the day, that propelled vessels from Europe past Africa into the Southern Ocean. So the Antarctic sea ice pack was first sighted by um, famous Captain James Cook in 1773 as he circumnavigated the region. He advised it foolhardy to any followers to venture any further south. But that didn't stop folks, and eventually in the 1800s, exploring expeditions from many nations began probing the continent. They indeed found riches in the form of uh, fur seals, whale oil, and ambergris. Who here knows what ambergris is? Oh, awesome. Okay, so these are the people you'll ask after I finish speaking. <laughs> in 1820, a 20-year-old Yankee sealer named Nathaniel Palmer was among the first to sight the Antarctic Peninsula. And in 1821, the American sealer Captain John Davis is likely to have taken the first steps on land on the peninsula. The next year, a British sealer, James Waddell, surpassed Cook's farthest south by three degrees in the ice pack of a sea that now bears his name. That's the one I pointed out to you earlier. And a Scottish map maker is credited with labeling the continent Antarctica in 1890. The name comes from Greek, anti or anti, meaning opposite, and arctos, meaning bear. So the new land was located on the opposite side of the planet from the Arctic home of the polar bear. Let me be clear, there are no polar bears in Antarctica. So then the US Civil War and attention to Africa and the Arctic brought about a several decade hiatus in Antarctic exploration. By 1895, however, attention returned to geographical conquests in the Southern Hemisphere and the so-called heroic era was launched. The South Pole was achieved in 1911, first by the Norwegian party led by Roald Amundsen, who's up here on the left, followed a month later by the British party led by Robert F. Scott on the right. Scott's party, pictured in the middle, perished on the return journey. You might not be aware that Scott and his men were pulling a very heavy loaded sled. The, the weight was largely from scientific samples right up to the moment they perished. So the significance of the heroic era to today's NSF-supported research is that much of the early exploration was based from the volcanic Ross Island in McMurdo Sound. And this is the location of the world's southernmost deep water port and home to the major logistics hub for the US Antarctic program. Early in the 1900s, the US took the lead in Antarctic exploration by exploiting new technologies and logistics capabilities. U.S. Navy Admiral Richard Evelyn Byrd led forays to Antarctica that included the first overflight of the South Pole in 1929, as well as occupying a series of research stations that he named Little Americas. So public interest in Antarctica at that time rivaled fascination with the Apollo moon landings that occurred 40 years later. In 1946, Byrd organized an unprecedented Antarctic expedition called Operation High Jump to conduct continent-wide aerial photography of Antarctica. Now, the photo on the left is of Bird dropping US flags at the pole during high jump. In many ways, the scope of this activity exceeded anything ever done before or since. 4,700 naval and marine personnel participated. There were 13 ships, including an aircraft carrier and a submarine, 19 fixed-wing aircraft, and four helicopters. 
And that was followed the next year by a slightly smaller operation windmill to ground truth the information of the high jump photos. And much of this work was carried out from the Rossi sector. On the Waddell side of the continent at the same time, Norwegian-born American citizen Captain Finn Ronnie accomplished 3,600 miles of exploration by ski and dog sled. So those activities set up the US as a leading participant in the subsequent 1957-58 International Geophysical Year, or IGY. For this, scientists from 67 countries joined forces to intensify geophysical observations all over the planet, and for the first time in space. Antarctica figured prominently among the environments of focus for the IGY. You recall that this was the time at which the, the Soviets had launched the satellite, the first satellite called Sputnik. And, and uh, that created some sense of urgency toward enhancing our nation's science capabilities. Paul Seipel, who participated as a Boy Scout in one of Admiral Byrd's first Antarctic uh, ventures, he's pictured on the right there, was a civilian charged with establishing a science program at South Pole Station. The station itself was constructed by members of the Navy's Construction Battalion, or CBs, during the IGY. And the international cooperation during the IGY led to a landmark, the landmark, Antarctic Treaty in 1959. So before I discuss the Antarctic Treaty in a bit more detail, let me a brief dis di digression here. You may have noticed, I know I did, that the people in all the previous slides were exclusively male. And it wasn't until the late 60s, 1969 to be precise, that the first all-women Antarctic science team pictured here from Ohio State University deployed to Antarctica. Today, as you can see, a woman heads up the NSF Office of Polar Programs. Women also act as senior US representative in Antarctica during the research season. They lead US research teams, maintain traverse vehicles, pilot our aircraft, among a host of other essential contributions. So while women were not permitted to participate in the International Geophysical Year in, in Antarctica, I'm happy to report that they were prevalent and prominent among the contributors to the most recent and highly successful International Polar Year of 2007-2008. All right, so back to the treaty. The IGY paved the way for a follow-on effort under the Eisenhower uh, administration to craft a treaty to set aside Antarctica for scientific purposes. The fact that it was successfully negotiated is really truly remarkable when you think about the times that it occurred in. This was the height of the Cold War. Um, the treaty was drafted in Washington, D.C. at the National Academy of Sciences, and the U.S. is one of the 12 original signatories. During the 50th anniversary of the signing in 2011, the treaty was reaffirmed for another 50 years. As you can see in this map, several nations have overlapping, overlapping claims in Antarctica, but under the treaty, such claims were put into abeyance, which means they're neither recognized nor denied. The US and Russia never made claims. The treaty is referred to as a first arms control agreement as military exercises are prohibited and member nations have a right and in fact responsibility to inspect each other's stations in Antarctica. So diplomacy through science has kept the peace in this region for over 60 years. The treaty is now up to 53 signatories, 29 of which by virtue of their active science programs are consultative parties, which means they have voting rights on uh, any measures put into place under its framework. The treaty operates by consensus. All 29 parties need to agree before things are adopted. So that makes it a little slow, but it makes it robust. One of the most important measures in place is the environmental protocol, which protects the environment and includes a ban on mining. Each country implements these measures, uh, such as the environmental protocol, through domestic laws and regulations. Now, the National Science Foundation, I'll be calling it NSF, has been involved in Antarctic research since the inception of the US Antarctic program. To exert the strongest form of leadership under the treaty system, it's vital that we not have only an active scientific presence in Antarctica, but also an influential one. So towards that end, we view it important to maintain our status as the world leading uh, Antarctic research program. And as one measure to ensure optimal investments, we support scientific research that is best done or can only be done in or on Antarctica. If 
that can be done elsewhere, we're not going to expend resources and effort to support it in Antarctica. But staying at the forefront of science requires us to be poised to respond to the best emergent ideas. The challenges of the Antarctic environment are such that we always need flexibility and excellent contingency planning to ensure safe operational support. The dynamics of science and operations go hand in hand and they require close collaboration. A presidential memoranda dating back to the 1980s, <laughs> uh, that's 6646, and subsequently reaffirmed, requires NSF to operate three stations year-round in Antarctica. Uh, Palmer Station on the peninsula, Edmondson Scott South Pole Station, and McMurdo Station on Ross Island. And on this map, you can also see the locations of approximately 80 stations of other nations scattered around the continent. And about 30 of these are operated on a year-round basis, with the rest being seasonal. It might look a little crowded on this map, but you've got to remember these 80 stations are spread out of an area one and a half times the size of the U.S. So the stations are generally very remote from each other. So while we're focused on a single continent, the U.S. Antarctic program, as you can see, is a global enterprise. This graphic shows uh, the two main supply routes for our stations that stretch over 10,000 miles each. NSF's headquarters are in the D.C. area. Those of our prime support contractor, now Lidos, are near Denver, Colorado. And we consolidate our shipping at Port Wyneme in California. So for Palmer Station, we generally transit supplies and people through Chile. The final leg of the journey is made by ship across the Drake Passage. There's no runway at Palmer. The other main supply route is via Christchurch, New Zealand as a stopping off spot for flights to McMurdo Station. And so from there, we typically make the journey to Amundsen Scott South Pole Station via skied LC-130 cargo aircraft, weather permitting. So NSF is powered to, empowered to reach out to obtain support for the program from the private sector, I already mentioned we have a contractor, other federal agencies and the military. And here you're looking at a range of aviation assets that we enlist to make the program function. I kept, I've already mentioned LC-130s, so that's the photo uh, on the top right there. Um, those aircraft are flown for us by the 109th unit of the Air National Guard out of Schenectady, New York. Shown underneath that is a U.S. Air Force C-17 aircraft, and those are deployed from Joint Base lewis McCord in Washington State for us. We charter additional fixed wing and rotary aircraft from the private sector. We also deploy marine assets. So on the right in this photo is the U.S. Coast Guard Icebreaker Polar Star out of Seattle, Washington. And that annually breaks a channel into uh, McMurdo Station through the sea ice to permit our resupply mission. And we charter um, a fuel tanker shown on the top and a cargo vessel for resupply shown on the bottom on the other side here. Uh, via the Military Sea Lift Command. We currently deliver about 6 million gallons per year of fuel that's uh, specially prepared for cold weather conditions. Cargo comes in on 600 to 1,000 containers annually, and incidentally, as many containers go off continent loaded with waste that we remove in conformance with the environmental protocol. So I'll talk about our research vessels in a moment. So in addition to these assets, um, weather and aviation services are obtained from Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command, we call it SPAWAR, in Charleston, South Carolina. The Army, Region, uh, Army Cold Regions Research Laboratory in New Hampshire provides expertise in ice and snow runway construction and maintenance. So next we're gonna take a quick tour through each of our stations. Start with Palmer Station on the Antarctic Peninsula. It's a relatively small operation capable of housing up to about 50 people. And it's an excellent place from which to base marine biological and bird research, among other things. And here you're looking at a recently completed boat dock and boat ramp that supports our uh, small boat operations. As I mentioned, one gets to Palmer Station via ship, and the program currently charters two research vessels. On the right is the Nathaniel B. Palmer. You've heard that name already. The Palmer was launched in 1992 and is a 94-meter uh, ice-breaking research vessel. The ship is a first-rate platform for marine-based studies, including atmospheric, biological, oceanographical, geological, and geophysical research. 
It can operate safely year-round in Antarctic waters that are often ice-covered and or stormy. And it accommodates about 37 scientists, has a crew of 22, and can operate up to 75 days out of port. The smaller of the two vessels, the Lawrence M. Gould, is 76 meters in length and is ice strengthened. The Gould accommodates 26 research scientists and is also capable of 75 day missions. Now, her primary missions include support of research in the Antarctic Peninsula region and resupply and transport of researchers and staff between Palmer Station and the South American ports. Here, you are looking at McMurdo Station in January, four years ago, when there was very little snow cover. The terrain is dark volcanic soil and dust. Sort of pointy mountain in the background is Observation Hill. And the station consists of multiple structures of varying ages distributed over a fairly large footprint. We can house about up to 1,000 people at peak occupancy. The Coast Guard icebreaker Polar Star is tied up to the ice pier in the foreground. That, by the way, that little embayment area is the deepest port in the southernmost place in Antarctica. Um, you will notice there's a lot of open water surrounding the station. Um, the white line across at the very top is the edge of the Ross Ice Shelf. So while sea ice can clear out of Ross Island Sound seasonally, it doesn't always do so. This past season, for example, the Polar Star had to cut a 55-mile channel in the sea ice to get to the pier. And the sea ice didn't clear out of the area. It's more typical to have to cut something like 12 miles. So, um, well, that happened despite the fact, if you were following the news, um, that satellite records showed the lowest ever summer sea ice cover for Antarctica. So this is just an excellent example. It's highly variable from place to place, but an excellent example of just how variable things can be and how difficult it can be to plan. So the trick is to anticipate that variability and to building contingencies in your planning. So we've become pretty good at doing just that. So McMurdo Station was originally set up in expeditionary mode during the IGY. Several structures uh, meant to last for three to five years are still standing and in use over 60 years later. Others sprung up as the science became more sophisticated and the needs arose. This place has the feel of an old mining town. And since we do intend to stay there for the foreseeable future, we're actively planning to modernize the station. So in contrast to McMurdo, this is our very deliberately planned and modern Amundsen Scott South Pole Station, which was uh, formally dedicated in 2008. This replaced a previous station structure that was becoming unsafe. I mentioned earlier that anything put on the surface at, at the ice at pole is quickly covered by blowing snow. So this new station, see if I can make this pointer work, um, is chamfered at that angle. Uh, in the face of the prevailing wind to direct blowing snow away from it. The station can also be jacked up on its legs to, to higher levels as the snow piles up. In fact, the reality is the snow has accumulated more than what you see in this photo. We're making plans to jack the station up within the next few years. So there is considerable infrastructure below the snow surface in addition to what you see here. For example, power plant, fuel storage, and water production are all subsurface. So building something of this scale in this remote location took an immense amount of vision and engineering as well as some intensive logistics planning. Everything to build this station had to fit in the cargo space of an LC-130 transport plane, and we've, I'm showing you this photo for scale. The temperatures are at the pole are so severe that the planes do not shut down their engines while they're on the ground. So we have to hot load and unload these aircraft. Um, they don't shut down because they have hydraulics and they would freeze. Um, so today, everything needed to support the station, such as fuel, scientific equipment, people, and food comes through McMurdo via traverse vehicles, like land tractors, or aircraft. Of course, we undertake all this intensive effort in support of the conduct of world-class science. So, let me start with astrophysics facilities at South Pole Station that enable frontier science regarding the nature and origins of our universe. These facilities all take advantage of unique environmental characteristics at the South Pole to acquire measurements not readily accessible elsewhere on Earth. 
For example, recall that Antarctica is like a desert. It turns out that if you were to compress all the water in the atmosphere overlying South Pole Station, it would only amount to about a millimeter. And that turns out to be very advantageous for observing our universe in the millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths, and specifically observing what we call cosmic microwave background radiation. While you can actually acquire even clearer signals of this by deploying detectors in space, that costs a whole lot more, and you can't readily upgrade them. And ready access turns out to be pretty important right now as detector technology continues to advance by leaps and bounds. So in this photo, you are looking at the 10-meter telescope at Pole. So one recurrent theme of polar science is to be at the cutting edge, we must strive to do things that no one else has done before. And this often requires us to embrace risk and to make long-term commitments. The 10-meter telescope would be impressive at any location on the planet, but the fact that it is located on the snow surface at South Pole is truly extreme. And you should be aware that this facility has very extensive local roots. I'm, gonna, I'm glancing over at John right now. Dr. John Carlstrom, a distinguished professor at the University of Chicago, was instrumental in the design of the telescope and heads up the research team that employs it. So under his leadership, a major upgrade of the 10-meter telescope detectors was successfully completed a few months ago and the improvements offer the promise of new breakthrough discoveries. But just in case you didn't get that he's local, I'm gonna remind you, Chicago. <laughs> Another impressive facility at South Pole is the Ice Cube neutrino detector. Neutrinos are tiny, nearly massless, uncharged particles that rarely interact with other matter. So it turns out that the very clear subsurface ice is an excellent medium for detecting light from those rare interactions with matter, and so the elusive neutrinos. IceCube is the world's largest neutrino detector, encompassing a cubic kilometer of ice from about one and a half to two and a half kilometers beneath the ice surface. To create it, holes were melted in the ice and before the water froze, cables containing highly sensitive photon detectors strung every 17 meters were lowered into the hole. So you see a detector being lowered into a, a hole just behind me here. 86 such holes were drilled in a hexagonal array. It's depicted in that, that uh, picture there. And if you look at it, you'll see uh, the Eiffel Tower just to the right for scale. An artist's rendition of what the array looks like from within the ice is shown on the right side of this slide. And the ends of the cables that connect over 5,000 sensors are drawn uh, together at the surface and connected both to power and computers in the structure that you see in the left photo. So IceCube searches for neutrinos from the most violent astrophysical sources, events like exploding stars, gamma ray bursts, and cataclysmic phenomena including black holes and, and neutron stars. And the results give us clues that are complementary to the cosmic microwave background findings regarding the fabric of our universe, including its still mysterious dark matter and energy. So this international project, led by the U.S., involves 300 physicists from 48 universities and national laboratories in 12 countries. To enhance the pace of discovery, the data management plan for IceCube set new precedents for data sharing and access. And IceCube is expected to be operational for at least two decades, but it's already proven award-worthy. So in, in 2013, the journal Physics World designated the first ever detection of high-energy extragalactic neutrinos by IceCube as the top physics discovery of the year. And the Smithsonian bestowed an innovation award on the creators of the detector technology in 2014. Several hundred papers, including many highly cited ones, have already resulted from IceCube and the telescopes at South Pole Station, with a promise of more to come. Another advantage of South Pole is its location in the convergence zone of the flux lines of the Earth's magnetic field. And so it's an excellent vantage point from which to study what we call space weather. You're already familiar with one manifestation of space weather. As the Earth encounters the stream of charged particles emitted from our sun known as the solar wind, that's what's depicted in the figure there, uh, the upper atmosphere in the polar regions can react with brilliant light shows known as auroras. We learned a lot about the auroras and the Earth's near space environment during the international uh, geophysical year. And that was purposefully timed to encompass a period of maximum sunspot activity and so really intensive solar wind. 
The associated interruption of radio signals made it particularly challenging to maintain communications during the IGY. But since that time, as society has built extensive electrical grids and become ever more reliant on satellites for navigation and communications, we're becoming increasingly vulnerable to space weather events. Although I heard about a nice microgrid set of ideas today at, uh, here, so that might help us there too. But it is perhaps more important than ever before to address the fundamental questions that remain regarding um, when and how the solar wind interacts with the Earth's magnetosphere and ionosphere. And one of the best ways to learn about it is to make simultaneous observations north and south. And so we've just completed uh, an array of six autonomous uh, antenna stations. And that's what you see on the figure on the right up there. And they, they're stretched along a 300-mile line in East Antarctica. Uh, and, the, and so this array complements an equivalent one in Greenland. So in addition to providing this greatly enhanced ability to make global-scale real-time observations, we're also funding studies that are teaching us about how the Earth's magnetic field varies, which is an important component of this. We can do this in part by looking at uh, minerals that, that lock in the field strength and direction uh, in Antarctica, among other places. So we also make significant contributions from Antarctica to understand the weather that affects you every day. Did you know that McMurdo Station serves as a key link in your daily weather forecasts? Well, how did that come to be? Well, it turns out that McMurdo is an excellent place from which to launch balloons because at the right time of year, they encircle the continent and come back more or less to where you launch them from. We take advantage of that to study all sorts of things. For example, NASA loves to test out sensors in this way before committing to really expensive space-based missions. So in 2010, NSF collaborated with the European Meteorological Satellite Group known as UMETSAT and the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, to calibrate a new generation of European uh, satellite-based weather sensors. The NSF Office of Polar Program supported the, the National Center for Atmospheric Research to develop a balloon payload containing expendable atmospheric profiling sensors called drop sons that could be remotely triggered on command. So that basket and payload are, are shown in this middle photo. As the new satellites passed overhead, the drop sons were triggered and recorded atmospheric conditions. And this successful intensive calibration exercise contributed to the record short time for formally ingesting this data into world forecast models. And we also aided that effort by establishing a capability to downlink that uh, satellite weather data to McMurdo. From there, the uh, data are um, beamed across to the Ross Island Sound to uh, Black Island, which is shown in the photo on the right. And from there, they can just barely see a German receiver satellite. So, so that data transmission linkage re results from a partnership between NSF, NASA, NOAA, and U UMETSAT. Um, so the, the upshot is this reduces what we call the latency of real-time weather data ingestion into models from what it had been a little over two hours to less than an hour. And inclusion of this McMurdo downlink is credited with improving the accuracy of regional forecasting uh, by European um, models by 45 percent. So it said that's why their forecasters were so successful uh, at, in projecting the trajectory and strength of Hurricane Sandy. And that's what the, it's not a great photo, but the photo on the left shows the aftermath of that event. So transmission of, of weather data for McMurdo will become all the more important for the next generation of satellite sensors and models. So as world forecasting becomes more reliant on McMurdo, we're preparing to ensure robust services well into the next several decades. We also enlist Antarctica's iconic life forms in helping us to understand how we might improve human health and well-being. For example, Waddell seals have a special trick that lets them conserve their oxygen as they stay underwater for long periods of time. They've evolved an ability to prioritize their blood flow to uh, their vital organs while restricting flow to the less essential ones. 
So NSF-funded researchers at Massachusetts General Hospital and the University of California, Santa Cruz, are interested in the molecular biology and genetics of this and related adaptations. They hope that understanding how seals use nitric oxide to regulate their blood pressure could provide the basis for new human blood pressure treatments. We've been studying Waddell seals since the early 1960s, and we know they're important to the Southern Ocean ecosystem. However, no one has ever been able to do a comprehensive count of the seals due to the harsh Antarctic weather and the fact that they live in remote locations. Now, with the advent of sufficiently resolved high-resolution satellite images, um, we, have a, we have the solution. However, it's proven difficult to automate the counting. It turns out humans are still better than machines at recognizing a seal from a block of ice. So, uh, and Antarctica is so vast that there are too many images for scientists to get the job done on their own. So NSF-funded scientists at the University of Minnesota and the University of Colorado at Boulder are asking for the public's help to look through thousands of Antarctic satellite images in the first ever comprehensive count of Waddell seals. Last summer, they completed a successful pilot program to do this with help from more than 5,000 volunteers who counted seals from satellite images of sea ice in the Ross Sea. And now the team is ready to expand the project to the entire continent. And um, there is a URL, it may be hard to see there, but if you simply Google Waddell seal count, you'll, you'll come up with how you could become involved if you wish to. Even some of the not so cuddly looking organisms in Antarctica are proving to offer potentially enormous benefits to humankind everywhere. In this example, uh, researchers at Palmer Station recently discovered that this Antarctic sea sponge, Dendrilla membranosa, makes a compound they call darwinolide that is effective against the drug-resistant superbug known as methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, better known perhaps to you as MRSA. Um, and the paper reporting this finding was recently recognized as the 2016 top view slash download of all 58 American Chemical Society journals. Uh, having nearly lost my young and otherwise quite healthy nephew to MRSA a few years ago makes me appreciate this discovery all the more. So not only does Antarctica harbor unique life forms today, it's also a treasure trove of life in the past. And it turns out that a number of Antarctic paleontologists are located in the Chicago area. For example, a team led by Dr. Neil Shubin at the University of Chicago deployed to the McMurdo Dry Valleys this past field season to work in an area that holds ancient floodplains and deltas from 385 million years ago. There, he and his team found fossils of the relatives of all living fish today, as well as the earliest creatures to walk on land. So in the picture at the top in, in the middle is the fossil of a very rare find of a tiny juvenile specimen of placoderms the common ancestor of all bony fish. Um, to the right of it is what it's thought to have looked like in life. Um, examination of these fossils is expected to reveal how the earliest bones developed. The team also discovered fossil fish with arm bones and paired nostrils, so they're close cousins of limbed animals that walk on land. Research from the, researchers from the Field Museum will deploy to Antarctica Shackleton Glacier this coming season to study the largest ever mass extinction event on the planet. Colloquially, it's known as the Great Dying. It occurred over 250, about 250 million years ago, and it wiped up out about 90% of uh, species on Earth. So little is known about the survivors of the extinction in Antarctica, although it's been hypothesized that the continent's more polar location shielded it from the worst of this extinction's effects. It also turns out to have rocks of the appropriate age. We know that from previous studies. So in addition to looking for fossils of ancient creatures, the geologists will use fossil soils and fossil plant matter to more precisely understand the climate of Antarctica across this extinction boundary. And by the way, NSF has supported the Field Museum to be the lead institution for an upcoming 7,000 square foot traveling exposition entitled Antarctic Dinosaurs and that's showcasing vertebrate paleontological and uh, geoscience research. That is scheduled to open here in Chicago in June of 2018, uh, and before traveling uh, nationally, so you can be the first to see it.
Chicago. I'm looking at the people right now who have done this work. <laughs> Of course, polar regions also hold highly valuable records of our past climate in their ice sheets. Among other things, the gas composition of the atmosphere gets locked into bubbles um, as successive snow layers are compressed under their own weight and converted to ice. So the third photo from the left here um, is a backlit thin section of ice held by gloved fingers to reveal the gas bubbles. So a, a core from Dome C in uh, the Antarctic Plateau showed that CO2 contents of our atmosphere and temperatures go cyclically hand in hand over glacial and interglacial cycles for the past 800,000 years. Their exact timing relationship was obscured by smearing of the signals in time. So as a follow on to these findings, the ice core community quested after much higher resolution records to answer remaining questions about how our climate system functions. In response to that quest, uh, polar programs funded a substantial effort at the West Antarctic Ice Sheet Divide to obtain 3,500 meters of ice core that embodies 68,000 years of annually resolved data. That 10-year, $100 million effort included developing advanced drilling capabilities. So you're looking at the coring system in the middle and far right photos. This project was not easy to support. It required setting up a drill camp at about the limit of an LC-130 flight range from McMurdo. And guess what provides high resolution in an ice core? A lot of snow, and with that usually comes bad weather. <laughs> so you're looking at a picture of the camp in this photo on the left, uh, in which the conditions were nice and I'm sure didn't last more than the time it took to take the photo. <laughs> Um, so, so not only the distance, but the weather posed really tough logistics challenges. So it took persistence and sustained funding for a decade, but the field effort is paying off with numerous publications and important discoveries. Importantly, the record shows uh, several episodes of abrupt climate change, whereby the CO2 and the temperature rise quickly within an interval of uh, one or two centuries and then level off in concert. And these abrupt changes are superimposed on more gradual millennial scale changes. The most likely explanation for the abrupt changes is that they are paced by changes in the North Atlantic circulation. And the longer scale changes appear linked with the Southern Ocean circulation. So advances in uh, understanding of how the Southern Ocean and combined Arctic North Atlantic circulation affect our climate system continue to be of high priority. Uh, of course, we need to actually weave together all the pieces to advance our ability to understand and predict the Earth's climate. One thing we're beginning to appreciate is just how dynamic ice sheets are. Going back a few decades ago, the science community was documenting the fact that ice flow around the margin of the ice sheet seemed to be concentrated in particular areas that we now call ice streams. So on this map, the ice streams are colored, and they have motions that get up to three kilometers per year. Also illustrated on the map by the red dots are areas experiencing a net loss of ice to the sea. Blue dots indicate areas of land ice accumulation. Now, the dots are sized according to their current magnitudes, so the, the box with the key shows the size of a 10 gigaton change. For perspective, the annual water consumption for Chicago and the surrounding communities is about 1.4 gigatons. You may recall that the size of the ice sheet is a balance between gaining and losing ice. And several lines of evidence show that Antarctic is currently on net losing ice mass at about 100 gigatons per year and the rate of the loss is increasing. So how much is this? One way to think about it is in terms of sea level rise. Sea level is currently rising about three millimeters per year. Approximately a third of that is due to thermal expansion of the warming seawater, another third to the loss of ice caps and glaciers, and one third due to the melting of Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. So as you can see on the map, the greatest losses are occurring in the West Antarctic ice sheet region around the Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers in particular. Scientists think what is happening at that location is that a layer of relatively warm subsurface seawater called circumpolar deep water is making its way onto the continental shelves and melting the underside of the floating ice shelves. Now this is coming about 
uh, both as circulation and the temperature of the seawater are changing. So scientists have studied this by setting up year-round stations on the ice shelves that take continuous measurements at the ice ocean and ice air interfaces. They've deployed autonomous vehicles to probe the seawater circulation and properties in the cavity underneath the, the floating ice shelf. We're monitoring things from space and are modeling these observations. So thus far, we have focused on the Pine Island Glacier, which had been the fastest moving system. It, it, a big piece of it broke off. It seemed to hit a new grounding spot and isn't moving as fast as it was. But our next immediate priority is the larger Thwaites Glacier. I'd like you to note in this figure the point called the grounding line. Just right here, it's where the ice is actually anchored to the land. Okay, it's not floating. I just want to say one other thing. I was talking about it earlier in the reception, but if you melt any ice that is already floating, you do not really contribute to sea level rise. So the sea ice melt in the Arctic, for example, is not contributing to sea level rise. Um, and, and that's similarly true for shelves. If you break off pieces of shelves, they're already floating, and as they melt, they're not gonna change the sea level. If this is at all confusing, let's talk about it afterwards. So this map shows the bedrock elevation underneath the ice. The cool colors indicate where the land sits below sea level, and the warmer ones are above. So recall that the Transantarctic mountain range separates the West and East Antarctic ice sheets. That's this. So this is the West Antarctic ice sheet, and this is the East. All right, so the science community is concerned about the trends in the Amundsen Sea region because the base of the West Antarctic ice sheet sits below sea level. There's nothing to stop continual melting by the ocean as their floating shelves retreat to their grounding lines. There are approximately five meters of equivalent sea level rise tied up in the more vulnerable West Antarctic ice sheet and about 60 in the East Antarctic ice sheet. So the net loss of land ice concentrated along the Amundsen Sea sector is currently responsible responsible for about 7% of global sea level rise. Now, we don't currently believe that the West Antarctic ice sheet will melt within this century, but we do think it's vulnerable and so important to study now. And based on conversations I was just having with co other colleagues in the room, uh, there are new chapters coming out and we can expect to hear uh, more interesting uh, facts about this soon. But I do want you to understand this. If sea level rises one meter by 2100, as some project, 145 million people would be displaced, and the lives of two billion people living in coastal areas around the world would be affected. So we're pushing to improve understanding of the processes responsible for recent changes to achieve more robust projections, projections of future sea level. Now, if you could pick up the ice sheet off Antarctica and peer underneath, you would see something like what is illustrated in this figure here on the left. The discovery over the past few decades or so of an extensive sub-ice sheet liquid hydrological system with over 400 lakes and streams has emerged as a very exciting research domain. Why? Well, two big reasons. One, water underneath the ice sheets lubricates their motion and makes them much more dynamic than we previously understood. And two, the underside of the ice sheet is isolated for long periods of time, and so it offers the possibility of the evolution of unique microbial life forms. Now, the tricky thing about possibly unique life forms is that one needs to be able to sample the environment cleanly. The U.S. chose to work just upstream of and up to the grounding lines of the Willens ice stream, where there was evidence for a small lake that flushes periodically. Such a site minimized the, the chances that we were gonna permanently contaminate the environment. So the NSF-sponsored wizard project was initiating dur during the international polar year. It was extreme in that it required melding innovative support with cutting edge science. So we were able to support it using a tractor traverse from McMurdo to the field area. The tractor trains transported very sophisticated drilling system fuel, laboratory space, and dwelling space for the research team. Wizard did achieve the first clean entry into a sub-ice sheet lake and found unique bacteria. 
Once the water was sampled cleanly, samples of the underlying sediment were taken, as shown in the upper right photo. Uh, studies on the suite of samples returned during the three years of field work continue, and I think we're about to get some new papers out on that shortly. It depends on how you work the payment books. From, our, from the paying part, it was three years. <laughs> um, but again, and you heard from one of them, this was a highly interdisciplinary effort in which Chicago-based researchers figured heavily. Go Chicago, I say. So um, I included this figure just to remind me to mention Lake Vostok. So in 1956, the Russians chose to occupy the geomagnetic pole since the US was at the geographic one. And this turned out to be a fortuitous choice for them in that Vostok station happens to be located over the largest subglacial lake in Antarctica. So Lake Vostok is about the size of Lake Ontario but it is at 1,300 feet under the surface of the ice. Its presence was surmised early on by the Russians and later confirmed by our observations from space and then radar. After drilling an ice core that covered 400,000 years of time, the Russians kept drilling to sample the unique lake below it. Now the jury's still out on whether the samples were collected cleanly enough to be trustworthy. So, in conclusion, I hope you've enjoyed this sampling of Antarctic extreme science. Uh, we would love to have you as ambassadors for the program. So I hope you'll take the opportunity to learn more about the US Antarctic program and to share what you learn with your neighbors, coworkers, friends, and family. You certainly have some of the most fabulous resources and experts in the Chicago area. Would everyone who has worked in Antarctica right now please stand up? Awesome, all right. As I mentioned at the beginning, at the outset, these guys are the heroes and they deserve a round of applause. Um, so, and also, I'm happy to take your questions, but with their help. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> oh, making me work. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful presentation. It was worth the one hour L ride to come here to hear it. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, my question is uh, about the uh, international cooperation there. And um, I was curious to know, are the same countries doing the same research? Like, are there two telescopes looking at the same thing? Or is there some kind of international cooperation about somebody, each country doing a different piece of research focusing on a different part of science? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, in fact, there's a huge amount of international cooperation in Antarctica. Uh, we have the projects I mentioned to you explicitly um, that had international engagement, but almost every project I talked about had some level of, of international involvement. Uh, indeed, the goal is not to just do the same thing in parallel, but to complement each other and to reinforce, um, and sometimes to make observations that one nation can't handle in, in, in answering a question, but to, to, to make those observations around and coordinate them. It's not a perfect system, so there are a lot of stations in the Antarctic Peninsula region. And there are many stations that are recording some of the same things. <clears throat> but there's a group which we call the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs. And we recognize this. So that's me and my peer equivalents from around the world. We meet regularly. Uh, we meet in concert with the Antarctic Treaty Meeting annually and also have our own meetings. And this is exactly what we put on the table. What are we doing? How can we complement each other? And you know, where can we improve? <coughs> I saw a hand go here, yeah. Uh, thanks for coming out to Chicago, really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna ask a question that's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, you don't know what the, f what the future holds, but what is your sense for the funding for the Antarctic program and the Arctic as well? 
Well, there are some challenges, of course. Um, <clears throat> there are heavy expenses uh, associated with doing research at the ends of the earth, both north and south. We're committed to try and do research support more efficiently. We had a major review of uh, the program, and they came up with a number of suggestions, and we've implemented a number of them. Um, so I, I think uh, as we move to implement even more, we're going to put ourselves in a much better position to sustain science support over the long run. In terms of the budget outlook, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic because we have very good support. We have good support in Congress, and it's bipartisan. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, like everyone right now, um, we, we will probably see uh, issues with, with budgets coming up, but in general, I don't, we're not going away. And I believe we have uh, pretty solid support. Um, so we're in the planning stages for, as I mentioned earlier, for completely overhauling McMurdo Station. And it's a project we call the Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization for Science Program, or AIMS. And we're in final uh, approval stages, whereby we would go to what we call final design review. When we move to have the station in that configuration, which is uh, over a much smaller footprint and consolidated, we're going to drastically improve our efficiency. Rather than having 16 warehouses, we will have three. And they will all be co-located with where you know, the activities take place that, that use them. Um, so so there, there's a lot going on that will be determined um, by decisions happening over the next couple of months for that project. And I think you know, we've involved the community in the design phases of that. And we will be involving the community in the construction phases of that as well coming forward. I'm curious, um, what does the scientific community in Antarctica think about the tourists? Um, so I should tell you about tourism from uh, a bigger picture perspective. There is an, a group called the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators that encompasses most of the people who are taking or and enterprises that are taking tourists to Antarctica. They started by meeting at the National Science Foundation before they had that name because they were mostly from the US and we had to issue their waste permits. And over time, because they were meeting with us, it was suggested by someone who works uh, in, in my unit that, that they put some standards on how they conduct tourism. So they made a very strong commitment to complying with um, the treaty uh, environmental protocol and to be educational as they took people to Antarctica. Uh, so, so from our perspective, it's a fantastic arrangement. Not everybody can go to Antarctica. When you think of the number of people on the planet, very few people ever get to Antarctica. But the people that go tend to be um, people who are you know, self-selected and being very interested and then they get exposure to the full treaty system, the scientific programs, the, the wonderful uh, life and, and scenery to see there. And they become the ambassadors, I think, uh, large. So you might think that it would be like you know, a, a friction, but generally not. We do have arrangements with IATO, the group, that we allow certain size parties to go to Palmer Station, and we have six slots per year, for example. And you know they make arrangements and work that out with us. And they know better than to show up when we're in the middle of a busy science thing and saying, "Hey, we're coming over." So you know, and we work with these folks um, quite productively. There was one right here. Yep. Uh, having been a tourist, I can comment on that briefly from that standpoint. And there's a lot of education that goes on with the tours about protecting the environment and you do once you've been there you become an ambassador definitely well, thank you for that I've seen pictures of uh, 
experiments being done in space. And uh, in that scenario, you basically, a scientist would send the experiment, and the astronaut will do the experiments, right, conduct experiments. The pictures you have shown, they seem to be scientists themselves doing the experiments. I wonder if there's a model where, or it's a combination that scientists can send experiments and somebody will do it over there, or the scientists themselves are involved most of the time. I'm, I'm not sure I caught the, the question. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. So, like, in the space environment, like in a, at ISS. Right, right. Most of the, uh, just because of logistics, the experiments are conducted by the astronauts, no matter right. what experiment it right, is. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Whereas in, in, in the pictures you have shown, it seems like scientists themselves are doing most of the experiments. But due to uh, the weather, it could, it's possible that they may not be there all the time. So is there a team of scientists at the location in Antarctica that run the Right, right. Okay, I think I understand the question now. Um, very generally, uh, we do still send scientists because they often have the right skills needed to get the job done. But So, for example, um, if you want to overwinter uh, at South Pole, you probably are uh, part of helping science along even very directly. Um, there, it might not be the principal investigator who does that, but it would be someone who be, acts on behalf of the community. And there are many such people uh, in all kinds of projects. So they, they are very important. They are doing the science on behalf of larger communities. I would like to say also that, you know, I, I told you there were over 300 scientists involved in Ice Cube. There's maybe only two or three people there who are actually on site for Ice Cube. So the other, the other people are getting the data from it. Actually, I work in Antarctica for almost 16 months, and at that time, I have seen many icebergs there. So, one thing I observed that when we see any iceberg, the 90% part of that iceberg deep inside the ice sea, and only what we see is only 10%. What is the science behind this? What is the what? What is the science behind this? Why we see the only 10% uh, part and only 90% part, oh. part deep in the? Why? Why is it that when you're looking at an iceberg, you're you're only seeing a fraction of it fl above the waterline. Yeah, exactly. It has to do with the density of ice. Okay, so, so interesting. Water is a great molecule. It's my favorite molecule. But um, the interesting thing that ice does, or, or water does, when it forms ice, is it goes from being, I like to think of it, it's a little bit like elbow macaroni, right? They, w when water is liquid, they're, they're all smushed around each other. But when it goes to form the ice crystals, they lock. Okay, so they, they actually make something that's less dense. Ice is less dense, right? And its density is just such that it's about, you know, 80% um, or between 80 and 90% of the seawater it's floating in. That's why you see that, that ratio. It's true, most of it's below the surface. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about waste. Uh, you mentioned that waste gets transported out of Antarctica. Are there any waste treatment system in place to treat that waste, or does it simply get packed and gets transported? Um, yes, indeed. So uh, at McMurdo Station, you can imagine, it's like a small town. We have a waste treatment plant, a sewage treatment plant. And once we've finished with, you know, sewage treatment plants use organisms to break down human waste, right? But um, once we've finished with those solids, uh, we actually desiccate them and pack them up and put them in boxes and take them off continent. And the clean water that comes out of the process goes back into the, into the sound there. Um, so, so that's one measure we have of cleaning our very local waste. Uh, food waste, we don't leave behind. Um, We've talked over the years about you know, trying to do uh, waste to energy conversion, but we don't want to do that in a way that creates any local form of pollution. So we, we haven't jumped into it yet, but it's certainly on the table as we're talking about modernizing things. But a good deal of our waste goes back to be recycled. We do a lot of uh, sorting of our waste in Antarctica and then bring it back to the States and recycle it. 
Oh, we had one more question. Let's take one more and then we'll be done. Hi, I really liked your presentation. Um, just when you were mentioning energy, I just thought of the wind, and I was wondering if you guys have like wind turbines and stuff. It's nice of you to ask. Let me find the slide that shows that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have we, we work together with uh, New Zealand, whose station is only two miles from ours, to capitalize three uh, wind turbines, and they generate about a megawatt of power. Um, they supply our station on average over the year about 17% of our power and nearly 100% of their smaller station. But yes, absolutely, renewables are an important thing, and we're trying to push out on being responsible and, and move to more of that. Um, so I, I thank you all for your patience. I, I really appreciate you coming out on a weeknight. Um, it's impressive. So thank you very much once again. I don't know. It's a good one. Yeah, we're, I, we're, we're finished. I think if you want to come up and ask a question at the end or something. I'll tell you what, I'm, just to indulge myself, I'm going to play two short videos. They're really short. They're less than 20 seconds of penguins. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, you, you, you can look at them when you're leaving. That's fine. <laughs> so, so these are ones that I took myself with my little cell phone camera. So, But these are emperor penguins. And I just think they're, they're so charming. Somebody asked me today whether I had any attachment to any of the animals, and I didn't. <laughs> yeah, so they, they get up to about this tall. No, no, these are emperors. They're the big ones. They have that beautiful coloring uh, that you can see there. And, and because, you know, we have protection so that we don't threaten animals, we, we don't perturb them. As long as you don't jump at them, they are not skittish and they are curious and they will come and, and talk to you like you just saw. Um, I'll, I'll play one more. I love how they move on their bellies. Um, so I have a nice little clip of that. Um, so make that full screen. <laughs> You can see, you know, their little tracks they leave, they're, they kind of wobble and they have the little points where the, their feet and flippers touch. And then they get a ring of snow around their beak when they stand up. They're pretty awesome. <laughs> Thanks for indulging me. <laughs>